Hear your name. Mr. Brown. Mr. White. Mr. Blonde. Mr. Blue. Mr. Orange. Mr. Pink. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the movie calendar. My name is Lee. My name's Terrence. And this week we kick off our Director December, our first one all about Quentin Tarantino, and we are beginning at the beginning with Reservoir Dogs. Yes. Oh my gosh, I'm so excited to talk about this movie. I did that just to give time for the title thing to come up in between. Ah, uh, yes, we're doing thing. graphics and stuff now. Yeah. That's fun. And now that that's gone, ba ba. How long has that been in there? That I've had that poster in the back of the movie cowl uh, since since Parasite episode, since episode one. I have owned that Reservoir Dogs poster. For those of you joining us on your favorite podcast app of choice, welcome. Hello. Uh, we do have a YouTube Hello. version as well, which is what we're referencing here on the set that we have. Hello. Uh, set. Wow. That's a... It's a set. Yeah, it's, it's kind of. Um, <laughs> my spare bedroom. Uh, and I have a, a poster here that I picked up at a flea market, like... Probably 15 years ago. 50 years ago? 50 years ago, At yeah. a shop that just sells fleas. It was Whoa. way ahead of its time. I'll just stop. Yes. Yeah, we're normally a lot funnier than that. Please don't little, leave just yet. Little teasers into Tarantino's... Uh, am I saying... No, the director December. Yeah, yes. we have. Over the last four First weeks, film. we have uh, yeah been, been trickling out little clues as to what we're going to do. And we announced it. Uh, on the last episode, as you know, because everyone checked out the Goonies episode that, yeah, we announced Quentin Tarantino was going to be the subject of the first director December for the movie calendar. Mm. And yeah, we had a discussion as to where we were going to start and uh, Reservoir Dogs seemed like an awesome place. Start at the beginning. Yep. So we've already announced the four films we're going to do. We have, yeah, that was in the end of the episode. We'll announce it again at the end of this one. There's time codes in the description below if you'd like to jump around. We're going to be getting into the plot of the film, just the style um, I've got it written down here. Dialogue uh, and the violence, and yeah, talking about Quentin Tarantino himself on the lead up to making this movie, uh, and uh, and a little bit after, and then yeah, we're going to our regular scheduled programming of our hashtag What About Whens, adding the film to the movie calendar, and then announcing the films after that. At mm -hmm. this point in time, we haven't decided what we're doing for January yet. It's not a themed month. Uh, we can do any films under the sun. If you have any suggestions, please let us know what they are. Um, we have a list of films that we want to do, but yeah, yeah if, if you have anything, let us know on Twitter or Instagram or send us an email. Links to all of the socials are down in the description below. We are at the movie cal everywhere. The movie cal at gmail.com is the email. You can find them all on the website, themoviecalendar.com. Wow, you didn't take a breath from like all of that. I was thinking, oh, I can do some uh, socials here and I can. Nope. Sorry. Nailed it. I'm. <laughs> you got it. I'm very excited. <laughs> what he said. Yeah. Yeah, I. Uh... I'm a Tarantino fan, but not compared to this person next to me. So <laughs> I might turn the mic off at some point. No. I might disappear. I'll put a cut out of myself here. You will take the reins on this, I would imagine. So I haven't watched the film. What's it like? I will I'll tell you what, I'll give no, you I a, I'll give you a, we should organize some kind of visual cue that I can give you to just go and make a cup of tea <laughs> and, uh, and pop on back. What would be your synopsis of this film? What's so this, name? so yeah, this film um, is about six strangers, criminals, uh, who band together or get recruited uh, to pull off a heist, a diamond heist, uh, but they couldn't have imagined how horrible it would go. Wow, you know, when you say it like that, okay, you added criminals and um, diamond heist, it almost sounded like the plot for the Goonies, except for these people don't know each other. But, you know, Goonies was this group of kids that come together. They don't know each other. That, they no, do they know, each they know each other. That is the whole plot of the all Goonies. Got, they're all like rejects of society. <laughs> so they're random. And they to do a big rich stuff heist. They you go don't, to steal the you treasure. You don't need to link every episode to another oh, I episode. I do. It's how I live. Oh, my uh, God. How I link movies are, to other movies. There are so many other movies that you could link this film to. Considering the cultural impact this film has and some of the movies that we've talked about. I think that was a direct link. Yeah, okay. Directly. I'm pretty sure Tarantino met with Spielberg and uh, and worked it out. And said, you know what? I want to yeah. do something like this in homage to you. Yeah, in homage to the Goonies. He made Reservoir Dogs. Bit of violence. Yeah. <laughs> Let's bring it into the city. <laughs> but yeah, this yeah this this film is incredible. Like, ahead of its time doesn't even describe it well enough. Like, it's, 
it it changed cinema forever. There's mm. there's quotes from critics that talk about when this film premiered at Sundance, where it was like that moment where there's a, a film I don't remember the name because it's got a, I think that it's French and I can't pronounce it, so I won't I won't try. Uh, I think it's in 1895 or maybe earlier. Uh, it's the first scene. Have you seen the train coming up into the station? Have you are you aware of this film? It's the first ever recorded. Have you seen it? Uh, uh, Do you know of it? Of film yes uh yes so they, yeah they, they showed an yeah. audience uh just a train the film of a train coming to the station and yeah. people ducked yeah, and ran, ran in the theater they thought that there was a train coming for them people have said that watching this film premiere at sundance was equivalent to that moment for wow. cinema yeah wow i also know that the fred ott sneeze is the first recorded thing in history just by the way in case people come at me in the mentions yeah that was the first yeah yeah um, video photo style thing right but the yeah. train yeah i've seen the train yeah so the train yeah people like running away from the from the screen thinking that a train was pulling into the station yeah so That's it has cool. been compared to that um i obviously really? wasn't there <laughs> obviously i would have been like <laughs> four years old um but yeah what a what a moment in history to be a part of um this film just just changed the game for everyone we are going to get into all of that um i recommend that we start with uh the style of the film Okay. Because it's just, it oozes cool. Any yes. other housekeeping before we get started? We should mention... Uh, spoilers. Spoilers ahead. We are going to be talking about the film as if you have seen it. So if you haven't, give it a watch. It is well worth your time. Um, bit of violence, a lot of swearing, uh, a lot of blood. But uh, yeah, if you can if you can stomach it, this one is a, an absolute must watch. You'd know by now whether you want to watch a Tarantino film or not. Yeah. Um, if you don't, if you just want to join us on this ride, that's absolutely fine too, but spoilers ahead. Spoilers everywhere. You don't want to spoil this. If you haven't seen it yet, don't don't spoil it. Go watch it first. Yeah. Incredible. And but let yeah. this video run in the background so we get a couple of counts up and then go watch <laughs> it and then come back and watch this again. Yes. I, this set the tone for Tarantino, right? This was kind of... For, for cinema. Wow. And for people outside of cinema like people started dressing like these characters like the cultural impact that this had just on society in general wow. especially in the uk yeah this film was massive in the uh, in england why do you think that is I, i'm not too sure there was just something about it that just spread like wildfire there's probably a couple of reasons one it was it was released in the uk after its its release at sundance and khan uh and it did its, its festivals then it went there and it, it stayed in the cinemas for quite some time and then it left and didn't get a home release until 95, so years later. So in 1994, they re-released it in cinemas again because people were still wanting to see it again wow. and again. And yeah, kids started dressing in the with the skinny black tie. Yeah. And, and yeah, there was just, just something about this film's style that just hit home for a generation of people. Yeah, it was very different for everyone, for every audience. And I guess quite a fresh take on storytelling not to mention the shooting styles and the the angles uh, the dialogue like oh, the every dialogue this we'll talk about could have inspired so many filmmakers and so many people to to think you know what i can i can do this it's not always about a setup scene where you expect this close-up shot you can do things differently yeah yeah, and very you can little, be violent. You can be graphic. Yes. And artistic. Very, very little close-ups. There's a lot of real wide shots to let mm. let the scenes breathe, let the actors have their moments, let the violence have its impact, mm. right? Which I'll, I'll talk about uh, uh, in a minute. But yeah, a lot of really long takes in this film yeah. just, to, just to allow these moments and these scenes to breathe. Um, but then, yeah, just mixing it up with, with how it's shot. Like the diner scene is a classic example. Like opening this film with this like camera rotating around the table almost like a voyeur into this mm. conversation listening to these just human beings have a conversation about things that they're passionate about things they care about things that they're uh that they have a, a strong knowledge base in like tarantini was able to write this incredible dialogue that just f naturally flows off the tongue that if you get it right it's just it's so conversational and he tapped into something where you know when people talk about their passions kind of like what i'm doing now where they have this kind of rhythm to it mm -hmm. like he was able to write it down it wasn't dialogue it was talking mm. wow very interesting or conversation 
I think that kind of writing has been finessed over the years because when I was watching this, I thought it seemed a bit contrived, in all honesty, as hurtful as that might sound to you, but it really did. And it might now, looking back on a 30 yeah, years ago well, lens. Now it, now it actually does to me as well, but I see it with the, um, with the, with the filter of what it's done for film. So, you know, there are things that can be dated. That's fine. I'm not a big fan of Tarantino's acting. Oh, no, he's a terrible actor. And, and I I'll hate be the first that, to admit and that. And I hate that he was the main player in the scene, especially the opening of it. But he, he you're allowed to have your day. You make the film, yep. you go for it, yep. you know? And it was great. It was a great part. <laughs> it, could have, you know? it could have been worse. So he was originally supposed to play Mr. Pink's character. Oh, I'm so glad he played the character he did. So that like that whole that Madonna thing was supposed to be done by Mr. Pink, but when he cast Steve Buscemi, he was like, Oh, like I want to do something. So he gave that to Mr. Brown instead, so that he could play Mr. Brown. Yeah. Um there's a really cool story, and I guess while we're here I'll I'll go into it as to as to how he ended up not playing Mr. Pink. It was during the auditions, uh, Steve Buscemi came in to read for Mr. White and uh, he's like, oh, I really like the character of Mr. Pink, and Tarantino was like, well, you're gonna have to, you're gonna have to smash out your audition in order to get that role away from me, and uh, Steve Buscemi delivered. And he did yeah, which kind of like people say that Tarantino's got this massive ego, and you know because he's like a god of what he does, like you can't touch a line of dialogue in a script, and like a lot of that is kind of true. But then he also has the ability to look outside of himself to be like, no, this person is going to be better at this and do it. And for like a, for a first film as well, to be able to do that yeah. is incredible. Like he knew that this this would make the film better and he went with it. Maybe that's the reason he was able to do it because it was his first... His first, it's his first he, direct, he still does it though. Not his first directorial debut, but, but his full film, right? He This is the first full film he directed. First feature film. And wrote... So he he wrote a bunch of us. We're gonna we're gonna talk about Tarantino towards right, the we'll end before we go into what about when. So right. I might hold off on a few of those okay. while we we'll stick with talking about the style of the film first, and we'll get into yeah. there. Otherwise, it's ju- if we don't have a structure, this is just gonna go everywhere. And you'll know by now how long the runtime of this episode is. We're gonna try and keep it short. Well, it'll it hopefully will be around the hour and a half mark, but or earlier or later, we'll find out. Uh, but yeah, the the style. Even the way that the story was structured, that non-linear storytelling, mm. like it's a heist film, where but you, you don't you don't see the heist. Yeah, yeah. This is uh, I, so before the record, I was telling Lee that up until I rewatched this film, which was a, a number of nights ago, I had this visual in my head because it had been years since I'd seen it. I had a visual of the heist happening, specifically where a manager's finger gets cut off. And of course, realizing this, that that's Harvey Keitel's scene where he has this great monologue about how to how to um, be threatening and yeah, how to and deal with people who are giving you pushback. How to deal with that? And I'm like, hang on. As he was talking, yeah, saying that this line, never thought, happened. Oh my god, you don't see the heist. That's amazing. Yeah, you incredible. It. It's ah, oh, just unbelievable. Yeah, like, and there was practical reasons for there not to be a heist shown because. The, the reason Tarantino was said in interviews, the reason why there's no heist in the script is because they didn't have the budget to film one. So you, they just had to write around it. And then later on, as he was sort of going to the final script development, he's like, oh no, this is actually really cool because it plays out in your mind then. Mm. Uh, yeah, which I think is, is really it's cool. a stunning piece of, of writing, of showing the before yeah. and the, like the, the planning and the aftermath of the heist itself, but never actually showing it go down. But it paints such a strong picture of what happens. Like, I know what happens in that jewellery store, mm. even though we don't see a frame of action from there. Oh, well, they explain it all. Exactly. They don't <sighs> need, you don't need to show it when the characters are going to talk about it anyway. Yeah. That's when it becomes patronising. Yeah. So don't show it. They're going to talk about it. Yeah. Also, the like sticking with style, this is the last point I have for style, and then we'll move on to um, <laughs> onto dialogue, which we've already tapped into a little bit. Uh, all of the cultural references in the film wasn't mm. something that was the norm for characters to speak about. Normally, what do you they, mean cultural references, like like this talking film? about oh, Madonna, Madonna yeah. or you know, uh, uh, I was going to say Jackie, Jackie Brown, <laughs> uh, Pam Greer, like all of the 
the way that they talk about music and how they're listening to this radio station who's doing yeah, the 70s yeah. throwback time and they're all loving it and having a great time oh the music well that to the into the style of it you know yep. what a great technique to actually have the entire score only be music that you actually hear in the film yeah I was wondering if you picked up and on that to tie it in uh, to have them talk in initial scene of hey how good is this radio station so they all get it in their head and you know that they're all listening to that radio station so what a great way to make it so that all the songs you love are going to be in this film make all your characters love the music and have a radio available everywhere lots of car stuff yeah lots of driving around Tony Turner loves his driving a random radio in a in a, in a mortuary uh, warehouse loading dock Let's put a radio there so we can do some cool stuff there that we are going to yeah. talk about. But yeah, no, no score, which is which is amazing. The fact that all of the mm. all of the music in the film is actual music, yeah, is just such a Tarantino thing to do. Yeah, is that di- oh I mentioned it ages ago? Diegetic? That's diegetic. Diegetic sound, sound. Right? or non-diegetic sound? No, this because there's some some of the music just plays. It'll be like someone will you hear it in the background. So you'll hear you'll hear you'll hear a song like "Hooked on a Feeling." But yeah. Blue Swede will come on. And it's playing in the film, yeah. and then it cuts to Mr. White and Mr. Orange in the car, and then you, you hear it really faint, and they're listening to it on the radio. But so it's, it's on the radio. So they it's kind blend of both. It. Yeah. yeah. So it's yeah, it works both. Mm. It's very so. Yes, I did pick up on that. Yeah. Awesome style, brilliant yeah. techniques. Yeah. Just just all the way through, making this just one of the coolest films. And Probably that, the it was the coolest film ever made at the time that it came out. Oh yeah, and it would have held that title for many and, years. Well, until his next film came out. Um, we, do we see I've it? got a we poster behind me. It. Can you see it? We won't mention it in case you can't see it, but yeah. we might. Yeah, no, no it's, it's sorry. There's a for people listening in yeah. case you can't see it. There's a poster of Pulp Fiction behind me. It's off to the side, so we kind of have to move a bit to see it. Yeah. Okay, but oh, um, back. The, <laughs> getting old. You're talking about how young you are with how old you are when you see it, and now you hurt your back. Yeah, no excuse. I got a bad back anyway. There, there was uh, with that style. You mentioned long shots and shooting wide. You know, you don't do it, need to do close ups. It's the same with the music. You know, long spanses of no score. It's okay. Silence is all right. Yeah. You know? Be comfortable with the su- with the yeah. quiet. And it's not it's not quiet. It's never quiet. You hear you hear cars in the background. You can hear people walking. It's be comfortable with that, and that's that's where people I think fell in love with this. It was so different, and no one really could put their finger on it. Yeah. Until afterwards, when you it was like, it. I don't. Yes, yeah, like I don't know why, yeah. but this was just a transcendent experience. Yeah, it was so real. Yeah, it's mm-hmm. awesome. Uh, dialogue. Yeah. So pithy. And everything flows so naturally. What's Tarant- pithy? What do you mean pithy? Sounds like a good word. Don't call me up on that. <laughs> You've never heard that before. I'm thinking, oh, I haven't really heard that being mentioned. Yeah, look, look it up. I'm, t- I'm teaching. <laughs> I'm changing minds. Uh, it's just everything Everything flows so well and it's so sharp and witty. Yeah. And he's got... It's not, But it's not witty for the sake of it being witty. It's all character driven. Like Tarantino who has obviously come up with a backstory for every single character in his film and he knows what they love and what they hate, yeah. you know, what their interests are, what music they listen to, uh, what movies they love and he's just... What their values are. Well, exactly. And yeah. he's just and he's just put it all in the film and it makes the interactions between them just so organic. Like that's how, that's how people speak. Yeah. Like they don't talk about their family all the time or the problems that they're having like they're talking about music and movies and interrupting each other one person's looking through a you know an old address book that he's got mm-hmm. and he can't figure it out and he's not part of this conversation and it's overlapping dialogue and losing your train of thought and yeah like it's all it's all so real uh and but yet like the, the language dances in this film out of the actor's mouths is probably the best way i can i can say it it's like a it's like a play I'm so glad you said it like that because that's exactly how I feel this played out uh, specific scene uh, when, actually whenever they're in the warehouse that's almost like it's a play it where, could, it could where you be. see a play appear in on a, on a stage and they've got a very basic set that's what this felt I would like. love to see a Reservoir Dogs musical Oh man, that would be amazing. Lin Manuel Miranda, get on that soon. (laughs) Yeah, but don't write music. Don't write any songs for it. Just do it as it is. No, do do, do never 
tell, tell Lin Manuel Miranda not to write music. Excuse I me. I didn't tell him. And thank you. you that is enough. Him. Wow. No, I'm just saying it doesn't need. That's like telling him not to breathe, Terence. Sorry, Lin. <laughs> That's not what I meant. No, it's fine. This I could see this being done. You know, believe it or not, I could see it being done in like a high school for a drama class or something yeah as a study and then wrecking it completely yeah but that's what they could do in <laughs> high school it's do. fine but every scene could have been done like that every every one of them yeah. seemed like it was acted out like that and a lot of it was due to the wide angle because you always see everything in the shot yeah there was never this this close up in your face I need to get the emotion on this person no you understood it all from their quality of acting you understood it from their stage presence you understood it from the way they held themselves and the way they interacted with each other they were each so individual but they were allowed to express that and um to be able to feel that about a film i thought was pretty impressive I, it totally took me away from the fact that i was watching it on a television yeah. I actually felt like like the realism, right? Yeah. The dialogue You're right in it. so much with that. Yeah. Um, you get so encapsulated in this world. Yeah. Have you seen The Hateful Eight? No. So, yeah, I've got, yeah, I've got another thing for The Hateful Eight there. Um, yeah. God, that was so much fun, that experience. I'll, I'll probably talk about that at some point. Um, that film is like a play. It's all set okay. in the one location. Oh. All the characters are, are like snow blizzarded in yeah yeah it could absolutely be a play another one by grade 12 yeah it's... maybe not that one okay i yeah, haven't no. seen it if i said it and i offended people i would not no have said no that no no, no it's fine that that's um it's not my weird. favorite tarantino film but yeah it's it's a very tarantino movie so if yeah. you're into his style like it's just full of it yeah oh very cool uh i was gonna say something oh pithy yes Ready? oh you looked it up yeah pithy here we go this will clear everything up <laughs> containing much pith so yeah I agree <laughs> that is one that's of what the I things meant. that's what I meant uh, succinct ah nice succinct or terse and vigorously expressive oh that one not succinct that one that <laughs> is the definition containing that I was much with. pith I was like you said succinct and I was like oh no this is not pithy at all this, this film is not succinct this film is long it's broad no but the dialogue is succinct yeah okay you know the the bit I was impressed with okay the whole thing was great but I like how Mr. Pink, our Steve Buscemi's character, defends his opinion to not tip. Yeah. You know, I was, I was thinking, yeah, because I've always, being in Australia, it's not a custom we, no. to just tip. It actually, we don't tip. I totally side with him. Yeah. And many people in, Same. in Australia would. But it's a total reflection on the, the, the job system in the states like how little they value their workers yeah. to have minimum wage so low that it's a disgusting thing that people are forced to work like that yeah it's like it's a total sad commentary on society over there right <laughs> sorry but you know <laughs> apologies to the apologies United States to the whole America. <laughs> country uh but yeah in, in australia obviously we're lucky enough that the minimum wage is actually livable yep. uh, and you don't rely on the kindness of strangers donating to live money so you can pay your rent that's why that's yeah that's yeah so yeah we shouldn't really compare great. but um no but his but argument we, we also was amazing. We, also, we also don't have a broken healthcare system so we win <clears throat> his, his <laughs> argument was amazing and his Excellent. ability to, to stand up for yeah. it and explain it was great all of the characters are so different and of like different education levels and like steve buscemi's character mr pink is just he is the smartest one in the room He's not the most confident. He's a bit unsure of himself. He's not a leader, mm. but he is. He he knows what's up. He can look into a situation, analyze it, figure out what's going on, and Very then logical. make decisions. Yes. Yeah. Um. Like like as soon as he comes into that warehouse and he's like, "Was that a setup or what?" Yeah. Yeah. Like he knows. Yeah. Uh, he knows that something's happened. He's put it together already. Yeah. And yeah, that scene in the diner of him talking about tipping is just. Absolutely. Incredible. And we, he we've is, just had a dog into the room, by the way. He in is case, the smartest. In case you see him. He is the, he's the most logical. Like yeah. even when Mr. White is about to say, you know, enough of this stupid Mr. White, Mr. Pink stuff. It's like, whoa, 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 whoa. Yeah. Don't tell me your name. I'm not going to tell you mine. Yeah. It's good. It's that, that, yeah. Those, that was a moment where you realize, yeah. okay, so we this, is, this is how we play. Yeah. It's this so good. Yeah. The dialogue. Tarantino also tests his dialogue in the film as well, which... Sounds very vague, but I'll, I'll, I'll explain what I mean. Where if dialogue isn't natural, 
then there are consequences. For who? So, in the characters in the film, I'm talking about Mr. Orange. Yeah. With the, Specifically about the commode story. Mm-hmm. He's trying to figure out what the commode story is and why it's important. And his boss, I'm guessing it's his boss that he meets in the diner. Yep. Uh, like the detective tells him guy. that you, like, if you nail this story, if you can get your dialogue around this character perfect, you're in. Also, if you don't, if you do it poorly, you're going to get killed. So the importance of dialogue, even within the film itself with the character mm. of Mr. Orange, is it has to be perfect. And I feel that's the kind of attention to detail of the performances that Tarantino is looking for. And that, well, that's my take on it anyway. Like he, he understands the importance of really good dialogue. Because yeah. if it doesn't work, it dies. I always like films that have acting within a movie. Yeah. Because that character gets to play two roles. Tim Roth crushes this film. And watching Tim Roth, oh. watching him go through that uh, conversation with his boss, his his energy, his excitement, his um, adrenaline, he's so excited he's in, and then seeing him being turned into a child trying to learn these lines. Yeah. Like he's rehearsing a project that he yeah. has to, walking, to deliver. Walking back over to the script and reading it. Like yeah. he's like reading it as if... Oh, he's, like, like he's reading yeah. it for the first time. He's and learning this thing. Listening to him again tell the again. story to his boss. Like where he's, he's doing the show, the performance of it. And he's still... He's very wooden and he's acting yeah. it up. And he's like talking the like a criminal would in a movie or a TV yeah. show. And then you see him in the bar and he's telling the story and it's so good. way more natural. So good. Yeah. It, th- that performance is so hard to do. And yeah, Tim Roth just crushes it. Yeah. Um, the we, we spoke about other... In another film, about whether a phrase was coined in that film or yes. not. Now, we did. there's a phrase in this film. Actually, there are two great lines in oh. the opening scene. Yep. One of them, you might pick the one that I'm going to ask. Yes. Okay, what's this? Yeah. So, I've heard that in different iterations. For those of you listening, uh, I just rubbed my thumb and my pointer finger together as if to say, what's this? World's smallest violin playing for that Just for the waitresses. waitresses. Just for the waitresses. So, I've heard that, you know, what's this smallest violin playing for you or whatever it is. So, I wonder if Tarantino was the mind in that. I don't know. I'd like to think so. I don't know that for sure. Why not? But that was pretty cool. And watching it again now, I'm like, he, when he does that, you know, he takes this pose and starts doing that motion. I thought, oh, no, <laughs> no. I can't think of a reference earlier than this. And the other one was same scene happening earlier than that when uh, Harvey Keitel, when Mr. White snatches the book out of Joe's hands and they have some back and forth. And someone says, someone shoot this guy. And I think it's uh, it's Mr. Blonde. Yeah. And he picks up the gun. Yeah. Oh, no, he pretends. No, he says... What he does says, he say? I'll shoot him. Uh, he says, Joe, do you want me to shoot this guy for you? Yeah. And Mr. White... I ha- you probably not word for I know, word. Well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you shoot yeah. me in a dream, you better wake up and apologize. Ah, oh, that was so good. And that gave... That gave me so much respect for Harvey Keitel, yeah. even more. Yeah, I mean, this is. Or you're gonna back you're then, gonna have but, some you know. more respect for Harvey Keitel when I f- finish this episode, telling you how uh, how much influence he actually had in oh, this cool. film. If you don't know, people will, but there'll be a bunch of people listening or watching that don't. And if Harvey Keitel doesn't get this script, this movie doesn't happen. Ooh. Yeah. So a little little tantalizing bit. We'll put that in the Tarantino section. He has great great lines in that opening scene, and then also in the scene once they arrive at the warehouse and Mister Pink comes in, and they have that incredible scene where the two of them are kind of in. They're washing up yeah. in, the, in the bathroom, and it's a long shot just down the corridor. Corridor single shot. Yeah. And you know, even things like here, I'll get you a smoke, and he doesn't have him on him. And he walks out of the room. You you always wonder like, did that meant was that meant to happen? Dude, Surely he would have had the smokes on him. He would have just got him more. Did they even say in the script to get him a smoke or yeah. clicking to light the Zippo? Yeah. Many times not working. Got it. Yeah. You know, like, I love that. I Cut, love that. And then he got it. 
But yeah, for all I know, yeah. for all I know, you're the rat. For all I know, you're the rat. Finally, now you're using. Now you're using your head. So good. Yeah, incredible. So good. Um, amazing. So that yeah, that might we'll cap off dialogue there. Um, good. This we're clicking through this. This is you're great. Really in control. This episode. Um, Look at this. Let's talk violence. Okay. Let's talk violence. Yes. Let's not be violent. It's not that kind of podcast. <laughs> we can yeah. We oh, talk, talk about violent. Okay. Talk about the violence. Uh, in this film because I can't be violent <laughs> I think yeah sorry in my house look at these arms um, I think a lot of people <laughs> a lot of people see this film and don't really understand that the violence has a purpose and they just think that it's violence for the sake of violence and it's just gratuitous for the sake of being gratuitous mm-hmm. and I can I can completely understand why you would think that and how you see it like that. I get it, because there is a, there is a lot in this film. But it also shows consequences. Like, this film doesn't show any violence without consequence. Like, the fact that we see Mr. Orange lying on a floor, dying for essentially the entire film, or the opening shot of him after the diner where he's just in the car and screaming mm-hmm. like a child looking for his mother lost in a supermarket mm. is, is horrific to watch. It's not just there for the sake of, of being there. They do... You're right. They actually show the pain involved with uh, violent trauma, or at least, you know, to, I, I, I'm lucky enough to have not have seen anything like that in real life. But um, there's no heroism or silent, oh, I've been shot and I'm bleeding out. Yeah. Well, there's no, oh, like, a lot, you know. like oh, cutting off someone's arm and then, oh, and blood spraying out. Yeah. Like, uh, that happens in Kill Bill, but um, but it's, purpose, it's stylized, it's, right? Yeah, exactly. It's, oh, that it's supposed to be stylized, but it happens like horror movies all the time. Will show yeah. people getting limbs cut off and yeah. and it's this for this, and, stuff. and it's, it's literally for, for shock yeah. shock value. Like there's no purpose for it, yeah. Um, other than to make everyone go oh gross. Whereas this one, I think it's supposed to show you how horrible it yeah. is. Yeah, and it does a good job of it. And you're right, it's it's got consequence. He also shows a lot of restraint, Tarantino, with the violence in this film. Like, the cutting of the ear, you don't actually see. They had originally shot it of watching it get cut off. And then they did the other one where they just pan away. Pan away from it, don't see it, let it happen off screen. Yeah, And I think it's so much more effective that way. Like, he knows when to hold back. Also, again, we don't see the heist. And the heist is apparently a massacre yep like so many people get shot at least four of the employees plus the plus the manager all get shot by mr blonde just massacring people so we don't and see we any a, of that we have a description of someone who's quite young as well so yeah we, we how feel old would that girl have been he's maybe shot a child yeah you know well child someone 21 if that right yeah. so could be a 17 18 year old a child yeah. yeah 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 so you don't like you don't see it and all at all has purpose yeah you do see a couple but you're right that yeah purpose, they're, they're necessary for the story and the scenes that are disturbing are designed to be disturbing like you mm. are supposed to feel that like when like when the ear does happen or when you see it for the first time when mr blonde is throwing the the petrol on uh on the police officer yeah. and you see the ear for the first time and that's been hacked off like it's you are supposed to feel shocked um the person who did the makeup i think this is right. I think I read this right. The person who did the makeup for the year is the same person who did the Freddy Krueger makeup. I think. Uh, and Tarantino was talking to him after a couple of the uh, couple of screenings that he went to see, and people would leave the theater during that ear ear scene. Um, Why would you leave a the theater? And the well, because in the height of like this activity, because you're like, this is gross. I'm I'm out of here. I'm, I don't I don't need to be a part of this. Like I understand. It. I get it. And yeah. the makeup artist went to Tarantino and said, it's a compliment. Only think of it as a compliment. You designed it to be disturbing. You literally just got exactly what you were trying to do. Yeah. Well, mm-hmm. yeah. So yeah, that's all I have to say about the violence. I, I like that we actually saw the year. Yeah. I was surprised that we saw it. Mm. You know, it was, it was clear already. They painted Mr. Blonde as a psycho. You know, they did that with yeah. talking about no, numerous times how he just went nuts he just started shooting people he's shooting children oh my god he's a psychopath he comes in they say he's a psychopath I don't want him here absolute Great. psychopath so when the camera pans away you know what he's doing 
It's not yep. unbelievable at all. He has a cutthroat razor. You know these things are sharp. Okay, cool. I just wanted to see it. As a viewer, I just wanted to see it, which I'm sure a lot of other people were like that as well. Cut away, and I was like, man, we don't see anything. We didn't see anyone yep. get shot. We saw the blood. Yep. Okay. It's not, it's, and that's the thing about the scene, right? It's not about that. It's not a. It's not, no. it's not about that at all. No, it's just, it's you're just showing the consequences of it. And it was satisfying to see it. Honestly, it was because there was curiosity there, and I still don't know if that's what it would really look like. Oh, I probably guess they not. had some sort of professional to go. Hey, what would it be? I don't know, but you know, that's what the makeup guy's for. But then th- there was no. I mean, there was talk about it afterwards, but it was quite human, like his reaction when he could finally talk to. Um, Mr. Um, Orange. Talk to Mr. Orange. He's in like so much pain and he's freaked out about it. Yeah. You know, I mean, it was funny that he's talking about that while he's lying there dying. Yeah. Th- those two, like, yeah, when Mr. Orange snaps and is just like, like, swears yeah. at him, shut he's up. like, I'm deformed. He's like, dude, I'm like, I'm dying here. I'm yeah. literally dying. Like, shut up. They're going to come and help. Yeah. It's going to be okay. And like, that's what I'm talking about. Like, it, it has yeah. purpose. It absolutely has purpose. Um, like, even the scene where. You see a little bit of their escape, and Mr. White shoots the police officers in the car with the two yeah. two hands in the gun. Yeah. Like, oh, like, oh, that's really cool. He's got the truth, and then it cuts to Mr. Orange and just the horrified look that he has on his face because Mr. White, who he has kind of built this relationship with since they started planning this heist, mm-hmm. uh, just watching his colleagues get get murdered, and just yeah. you can see the conflict on his face. Yeah, he's such a nice guy, Mr. White. Apart from the fact that he shoots people, police yeah. officers, no real people. Yeah. Remember that line? Yeah. Mr. Pink is like, so who'd you shoot? Just a couple Just of a cops. cops. Oh, no, so no real no people. No real people, yeah. Whew, that's, th- there was a nice... Again, this movie nice is ahead of its time. <laughs> snuck in line there to show that there is some sort of line that they will yeah. not cross. Yep. A victim is a, is a civilian. A policeman is the enemy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which is... Okay. No, any kids watching this, that's not the case. But, you know, it, it was kind of weird that they have this sort of morality... And that Mr. White is just so nice. He becomes this real nice big brother, father figure, you know. Come on, are you a doctor? Don't be an idiot. Yeah, yeah. That's that's totally a dad thing. Remind me again. An uncle, you know. Yeah, that was good. I I really fell in love with uh, Mr. White's character and his his values um, of everything and even how he cares for Mr. Pink afterwards. He offers him a cigarette. Come on, wash your face. And be cool. Are you cool? cool nice little foreshadowings happening for other films which i'm guessing we're going to talk about probably they'll drop in i wonder how much of this film influenced his writing of other films or how much this film was kind of a testing ground for some of his themes well now's a a good chance while we're here if you'd like to we can jump into talking about tarantino himself and kind of lead up to lead up to this and then before we go to what about when we'll probably just touch on a few other things if we've if we've missed them which there are numerous things to talk about with this film but no quentin tarantino so at the time of making this film he was uh working in a video store with uh with a a good friend of his lawrence bender who you'll see that name pop up as a producer on the film Uh, and he's 28 years old when he starts making this tarantino yeah which just, if that doesn't make you feel unaccomplished, nothing will. <laughs> I know, right? Yes, no, I would feel that. Yeah. So he <laughs> he wrote a bunch of scripts and was pitching them around. Uh, he wrote Natural Born Killers uh, and he wrote True Romance, which ended up mm. being going on directed by Tony Scott. Mm. Uh, and Natural Born Killers was Oliver Stone. Uh, and then he wrote Reservoir Dogs. And when he was sh- shopping it around, it had written on the front of the script, written by and to be directed by Quentin Tarantino. Like it was not for sale yeah. unless he was going to direct it. Like he he knew that if he sold this to a studio, they'd just bastardize it. Yeah. And that's not what he wanted for his for his great piece of art. Uh, and, I, and I just, I love that. He also was going to make the film with his friend Lawrence for $30,000 <laughs> with a 16 mil camera where Lawrence was going to play a cop and he was going to play Mr. Pink and it was just going to be like a chase through the street essentially with the diamonds like that was just going to be the the film that they were going to make were they going to chop it up and go backwards and forwards to before well, they didn't have the budget after. like it was I have no idea what it would have been that version 
Uh, I'm sure it would have been great, but it would have nowhere near have been the masterpiece that it is today. Yeah. And it wasn't until Lawrence Bender gave the script to his acting coach, who was friends with the the wife of Harvey Keitel. As you are, as no. you would be. Sorry, I got it wrong. Lawrence Bender's acting coach's wife was friends with Harvey Keitel. Not Harvey Keitel's wife. No. Harvey Keitel's wife had nothing to do with it. Acting coach's wife was friends with Harvey Keitel. Yeah. And so she got the script and gave it to Harvey Keitel, who read it, called Tarantino, said, I want to be a co-producer. Let's try and get some money. And they ended up raising $1.5 million, a little bit more than the 30,000, and taught him how to to do castings. And yeah. No way. Yeah. It was incredible. So yeah, that's that's why I said, without Harvey Keitel... This film does not happen. And Quentin Tarantino might not exist. He might have just been a blip on the on the radar. How many films is Harvey Keitel in? How many Tarantino films? I only know two. But is he in others Oh, he's in, well? a, he's in a few. His voice appears in Inglorious Bastards on the other end of the radio. Oh, when, cool. When, uh, when Brad Pitt's character calls back home. Uh, he's obviously in Pulp, Pulp Fiction, Fiction the wolf. Uh, as the wolf. Mr. Wolf. So cool. Uh, he's probably in more. Yeah, I can't think of any. I could look it up. I'm not going to look it up. No, there. that's yeah. So I that's know he's really definitely cool. he's definitely in three. So Tarantino great. would be indebted to Harvey Keitel massively, and and wow. sings his praises constantly, and and, yeah. and will actively say, without Harvey Keitel, I I don't exist. Wow. Yeah. It's awesome. Oh, what a cool guy. Absolutely awesome, right? Oh. But yeah, uh, yeah. To be directed by Quentin Tarantino. Um, also, in case you weren't aware, Quentin Tarantino knows more about film and cinema than almost anybody on the planet. Like, he would have forgotten more about cinema than I will actively ever know, ever, in my life. I have a feeling he'd be at, have I said something like this before, he'd be at like a savant level oh, of, yeah. of knowledge. It's crazy. And music as well. He's like that with music too. Yeah. It's just, there's just something about the way his brain works. And it probably has a lot to do with the way he he was brought up. Like his parents loved taking him to movies, even when he was like, essentially a baby. Mm. Like he, I was listening to an interview with him this week. And what was it that he went and saw when he was like four years old or five years old? I can't remember, but it was like, Oscar. Hey, (laughs) my puppy barking in case anyone's <laughs> just having a bit of a growl it's tired and he wants to go to bed he's been walking around a bit if you've heard him he's <laughs> sniffing and scratching and uh how, yeah, I, I don't know what the film was but it was something that like a, a child probably shouldn't go and see a real hyper violent film and he's like oh no it was fine <laughs> like parents didn't care he's like yeah. i learned to respect the cinema from my parents that it was a place that this is adult time now and if i want to be cool and fit in with the adults i've got to be cool Oh, and just sit in my seat. That's awesome. And yeah, right. Ah, oh, he should talk to my kids. Right, they should talk to every kid. Yeah, just be cool in the cinema, people. It is a place to enjoy a film, not to be on your phone, not to run up and down the aisles. Just chill and let the experience wash over you. Cinemas for kids are like playgrounds at night time. It's awful. They're so cool. Yeah, no. my kids love running right down the front. I remember them doing that, and they got to the front there. Hey, Dad! And I was like, oh, sinking. Like if it's I go to a kids kid. film, I get it. Okay, yes, I it was get a kids it. film. I it understand, that's fine. But like there's a there's a certain age that you get to where it's like sit sit down, <laughs> get out. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah. Yeah, kids films you don't go to watch the film. You go yeah. to take your kids to a film so they can play in movie chairs. Yeah. But no, yeah, so the the lead up the lead up to making this film from being a nobody sleeping on your friend's couch wow. to then pretty much overnight success where he took this film to Sundance. And I'm not sure whether it was at Sundance or another another film festival. I think it might have been Sundance where he stopped the film because it wasn't being projected correctly. <laughs> they had the wrong lens on the oh. on the projector, so it was cutting off oh, certain parts yeah, of the yeah, film yeah. and he no, just stood can't. up and went, nah! Turn it off, get the right lens. I need people to experience <laughs> experience this film. There was also, wow. I think, a, a power outage happened as well um, during one of the first screenings. And yeah, it was, he said it was just a total crap show. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> and they filmed, they did it again like the next week or something and it blew everyone's minds. Oh, geez, lucky you did that. Yeah. 
Wow, imagine the balls you'd have to have to I know. stand up, especially your first film. I'd be cowering, going, oh, no, it looks wrong. Oh, no, that's the end. That's the end. Good on him. Yeah, right? Good and, but, that, but that's so him, though. Look, I reckon he does have a massive ego, but it has worked for him with everything. And when he knows yeah. to let something that's going to be better than what he thought it was going to be come along he will let it like Steve Buscemi I don't know if that was a first film thing because first time directors first films it's almost like that is the biggest their ego will ever get yeah Yeah, right so I I think he does have one but there are a few times where he knows where to keep it in check absolutely but look he does know more than pretty much anyone so you know who? Who are you to tell me how to do that? I know that this exactly. is going to work. So was, fair enough. I was gonna. I was gonna. Yeah, fair try enough. and find a point to jump in when, when, like when you have an ego that, that that's that big, and also that merited. Like he, that's it. He's, he's earned it. Honestly, he's got it. he yeah. can he can be egotistical when you are literally one of the most knowledgeable people on the planet about the the art form that yeah. you're in. No, that's fair enough. Like, it's fine. I mean, sure, humbleness is great, and I, I'm not a big fan of ego. I, I think it's kind of gross. Tarantino can get away with it in he's my right. mind. He's just... He's so good at what he does yeah, that he's he's, right. he's he's earned it. You're all yeah. right. You're all right, Quentin. Yeah, as long as you're not being, like, an ass to anyone, like, yeah, actively which, being aggressive... He's not like that, then, is he? No, I wouldn't. I don't think so. I hope not. Don't yeah. be like that. He's not. You're not. You're not. Yeah. This is your month, okay, mate. A, you he, better be all right. He has a... He has a, a uh, a high respect for his actors and his crew and oh that's um, good yeah he always brings back the same people again he loves working with them and he's got a mantra on set where like he's got this apparently he's got this fervent energy that if it's ever like you're filming late at night and you take after take and it's just not working out he just brings out this energy in everyone wow. being like we we get to make believe for a living like how cool is this and, uh, and he'll say, we're going to do one more take. Why? And the entire cast and crew all shout at the same time, because we love making movies. He's like, cool, we're going again. Wow. That's really cool. That's what a director does, right? Yeah. The director has to bring it out of everyone. Yeah, so respect. Mad respect for the man. Well, that's cool. We've got heaps of time. We were supposed to go into what about when. Well, let's... I'd on. love to talk about the characters then yeah. while we've got a chance. I didn't yeah. think we'd get a chance to talk about them. So we'll do a quick character segment on the fly. This is fun. I have no notes. <laughs> Well, who should we talk about first? Oh, Mr. Pink or Mr. Orange or Mr. White or Mr. Brown or Mr. Blonde or Mr. Blue would be fantastic. Or Eddie, nice guy Eddie or Joe or... Yeah, any of those characters. Any of those characters. All right, Mr. Pink. Mr. Pink, Steve Buscemi, All so right. good. We spoke about him a little bit already. Yeah. Um, smartest man in the room, I would say, by far. Yeah, not the most courageous. No, no, he he's doesn't really have any leadership qualities. No, um, to have people follow him, but he's he's the ideas person. So, what do you think the moral of this story was to let him run away with the diamonds at the end and th- get away? I think the having the smartest person in the room be the one to survive. Not the it, nicest. No, not the strongest. Not the most, not the most assertive, cutthroat. Yeah, not the most masculine, l- lunatic. Yeah, although okay. he Smartest. he probably ended up getting arrested and he got the death penalty at that time. Yeah, because the, the place States, was swarming but... with cops. Yeah, right? so he, he, prob- <laughs> he probably didn't survive anyway. He just ran into the arms of the police. Mm. I like to think that he escaped. I don't know how, but I like to think he escaped with the diamonds. Yeah, and then the the diamond, the bag of diamonds morphed into a black briefcase that oh. popped up in the next film maybe maybe <laughs> yeah I'll talk about that I'm really excited to talk about that but no Mr. Pink yeah in incredible forms I think for me he gives the best performance yep oh, Mr. Orange they're, whole, some, they're really good honestly Harvey Keitel's performance leaves me a little bit lackluster there's a few lines that seem a little bit red rather than yeah I'm, maybe I mean he, he plays a really soft he plays a softie yeah. as well, and he's meant to be real hard ass. But there's a line where Mr. Pink is having a go at him for telling him, for telling Mr. Orange his name. Yeah. And he goes on this. What was I supposed to do? The man was dying in my arms. I was supposed to say I'm sorry. It's against the rules. He just the way that he yells at him the first time just it sounds a bit wooden. Yeah. And I'm so sorry, Harvey Keitel. You are a genius and you're amazing. But yeah, there's. I didn't say it. There's a yeah. There's, a, there's that. that just it's just that particular moment, and I'm like, 
He's acting. Look, I kind he's of agree. Not, but he's not in the scene. He's acting. But I kind of see that with a few of his things. And yeah. I, I let it slide because there are people that are like that. Like, Yeah, true. There are people that when you talk to them, you're like, why are you talking so weird? Yeah. <laughs> um, and he is yeah. quite caricatured as well. Like he has yeah. this, he has this, this personality that is just like, what, do you really talk like that? But that's, you know, things like that. He's got this incredibly rough, rusk voice as well. He's got a really cool characterization that is natural so i think whenever they're poorly you know similar to like christopher walken you know his pattern of speech normally is just very different to anything you'd ever hear but it's also just the way he speaks he's so cool yeah we'll talk about him uh, at some point i guess we will yeah of course how could we talk about tarantino and not talk about pop yeah. fiction it, that would just be ugh, god could you imagine all right so pink um yeah i talked about pink uh mr orange yeah. is probably the most complex character out of the entire cast yeah. of characters because he's the one that's he's the rat right he's he's infiltrating there's a couple of really interesting nods in the writing that he is the person who is the police officer right in the dining scene where it's the tipping scene right mr pink hasn't tipped joe comes back uh and he's like who didn't tip and mr orange rats him out yeah Ooh. he's the right Oh, mind blown so he's like Mr. Pink and yeah. it's just a throwaway thing yeah, yeah, yeah. but when you like take a step back he's he's ratting him out he's the, he's the rat <laughs> I've just blown Terrence's what mind what a tell I know right what an idiot I know <laughs> <laughs> I mean he doesn't get busted yeah but his his performance is incredible like him as the cop and as the criminal undercover is just insane and no one rides around in pain in the backseat of a car like I've Tim Roth seen, does. I've never seen anything like that. It's insane. He's squealing oh. and, and and crying. Kick in the seat. Yeah. I mean I want that's another one that I wonder. I'm like, if I was in that much pain, would I be? You know you know you're gonna lose blood. You know you should probably not move around a lot. Like I would I say know. that that because he immediately he immediately shoots he gets shot, shoots the woman. Yeah has the realization that he's just shot a bystander. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so it's a psychological he, he's, panic he, as well. In, straight in the backseat of the car and they're driving to the warehouse, which is probably not that far away. So this is probably right after he's gotten in the car. Mm. Fresh blood is everywhere and he's just adrenaline and he's still in shock. So yeah. You can't believe that he's that she killed him is some of the line yeah. that he says and, and all the blood's just scaring the crap out of him. And Yeah. Oh, it is incredible. He's so scared. He's so scared in that scene. It's awesome. Yeah, and it, it, it's... It, you learn very quickly that he's learned Mr. White's name. Yeah. Because he says Larry, Larry? and Dino. Yeah. yeah. Um, I was trying to take note of whenever we hear a real person's name as well. It didn't go well. I got too wrapped up in the film. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's hard to take notes during this one. <laughs> and the phone goes down. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Diner scene was awesome. Yep. Madonna, great. No notes. Credit. Damn it! <laughs> <laughs> what did I do? Put the lime in the coconut. You're like, what happened? And he's the first. He's not, no, he's not the first. What's the first line you hear in the film? It's Tarantino talking about Madonna. Uh, Madonna, right? Yep. <laughs> but then it's almost like a pre credits section. Because then after that, we get into the, uh, the, the walking to the car scene. Oh, my God. The Iconic. epitome of cool. Yeah. Iconic. And that song. Yeah. That the, the little green bag has been in my head and out of my mouth for the last week at work. Honestly, it's been hard to, to you know, even before that. So to keep it a secret, and because people at work know what I do, I'm thinking, do, 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 do. oh, that was a coconut song. But And, and I walk <laughs> past someone, I walk past someone and I'm humming a little green bag and they look at me like, no, nothing, 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 nothing. But no, just if you want to make it, like characters look cool, just get Tarantino to direct them. Like that slow motion walk to that music. There's a, a there's a bonus feature on the on the version that I, that I own. Um, and it's got interviews with a whole bunch of critics and stuff and one of them was like he Tarantino has turned these people into gods oh, yeah. turned the characters into gods like that music that slow-mo like instant right. god status for cinema I, I watched a film when I graduated high school and it was made by some amateurs it was made by the kids in my grade 12 class and it was the end of year video and they used that scene of course of course they did I had not seen the film 
the film had only come out a couple of years before wait when was this done 92 92 okay so a few years prior i hadn't seen the film yet so i just turned 18 these guys obviously had and they made an homage to it in their own style and i was watching our grade 12 farewell video thinking this is so cool yeah. what a cool song <laughs> Yeah, I, these these people are creative geniuses. I watched this film in I think ninety nine or two thousand like, for the those first time. Bastards <laughs> stole it. You stole it. I'm like, what, what? who's around me that knows what I'm talking about? No one here. Oh my god, that's hilarious. I just think it's now. I I look at those guys that made the film. I'm thinking. Wow, how did you watch that film? Like you were that was me you were underage. That was me <laughs> watching The Shining, and for the first time when we recorded the, the Shining episode. And I was just like, oh, that's what this <laughs> the movie's from. All these references. Yep. And the same for the Stuck in the Middle yep. song. And I'd heard that for years before, uh, listening to all the friends tape in a car over and over and all these road trips. And then I see this film and that song was always just a bit of a weird pop song. I'm like, why are they listening to this in this mix of, of other things? Holy moly, not only did yeah, I not know context. it was in the song, uh, not only did I know it wasn't in the movie, no, I didn't know it was in the movie, but I had no idea the weight that, it that carries. this <laughs> song carries culturally. I had no idea. None. Yeah. Boom. This is why we left time at the end, by the way. We're still apparently talking about characters. Sorry. Reservoir Dogs. <laughs> no, we're both doing it, so nah, it's fine. It doesn't matter. Well, maybe that leads to Mr. Blonde. Mr. Blonde. Michael Madsen is awesome in this movie and he really butted heads with his character as well so he's a pacifist not violent in any way and he found it quite difficult to shoot a lot of the scenes for this character to the point where they had to stop filming during the the torture scene because he was he was having a little bit of a, of a hard time getting to where he needed to be um psychotic yeah yeah playing that real kind of like zero empathy dead yeah. behind the eyes yeah. uh, person having fun too he was right. enjoying it yeah which is would be so hard to do for anyone um, I'd, I'd imagine but yeah he he did it so well and Tarantino just directs the hell out of his actors like he I don't know what he does whether it's just the atmosphere he creates on set or the notes that he gives or just the backstories like whatever it is that he mm. does he gets the best performances out of the actors that I have seen any director do ever yeah it's insane and i think a lot of that does come from earlier you were saying about how he writes a backstory for every character he has to and yeah. any good writer does but he creates these backstories that are totally uh totally personal that you can relate to instantly i don't think it's full of highlights oh you did this and you did this but it's like yep. here this person has a dog and this person, yeah, you know, the he, dog once got run he over. He knows and all it's, that. that it's crazy. Your... There's a yeah. a slight spoiler for the Hateful Eight. You'll be fine with this one, but just in case, um, uh, Channing Tatum is in the in the film in a very mm. small role and for a brief moment. And he was in an interview with one of the late night shows on on in America. I don't know which one. And he was talking about how Tarantino directs and and how he how he establishes the characters because normally you you would create as an actor you would create a backstory and and you've got moments to fill in the blanks but he would ask tarantino being like oh my character obviously led a, a previous life and has been reincarnated into the, reincarnated into this character um was just, he just made this up like the previous life that this person led like what suit were they buried in and tarantino would be like this like like this one like he is he goes that deep in his characters like wow. he knows the moment they were born, every day they led to the day that they die, and we're just showing we're just showing uh, a couple of days in the life of this person. But he knows every detail on mm. either side of those days, yes. and he'd have to. Oh, it's it's to. awesome. That's he takes he such good it. care of his actors. That's how he gets these actors to create their own yeah personality. They're so real. Yeah, uh, so good. Yeah, so, so I think that's that's probably how he helped Mads. Um, not Mads. Madsen, Michael Madsen. Michael. I was thinking Mads Mickelson. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Michael. It, yeah. What was the scene? You said there was... Oh, the, cut, like the cutting off the ear and the throwing the petrol on okay. um, the scene. There was a moment where uh, the, the actor playing the police officer 
um, is 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 screaming, you know, don't do this. Uh, and he ad he's begging for and mercy, he's begging for yeah. mercy, and he and he ad libs a line that wasn't in the script, and he says uh, something to the effect of, like I've got like I've got a kid at home, or I've got a son at home, and yeah, uh, Michael Madsen had just become a father quite recently, and it just it impacted him in a way that he just sort of shut down and had to leave. He's like, I can't do it anymore. In fact, apparently there's a version of this film that exists on film print somewhere. There's an edit where you can actually hear someone in the background and it's believed to be Tarantino himself when that scene is happening and you hear the actor say, I've got a kid at home. You hear Tarantino in the background say, oh, no, 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 before it, before the, the oh. cut actually goes off because he knew exactly what it was going to do uh, to Michael, yeah. Yeah. Horrible. Oh. Uh, yeah, if you... After becoming a parent, anything to do with kids, anything... You you just turn into a blob of jelly. Yeah. You can't you can't function anything. You hear a kid screaming for whatever reason, even if it's of joy, immediately yeah, your hands hairs stand up on the back of your neck. You it up. takes a while before that gets out of your system. A long while. Yeah. You yeah. imagine. Oh, that's a tough one. If you if you around someone and you say something and someone says, Oh, look, I've got kids. Yeah, give them that respect because that yeah. hit them in a place you will never know. Yeah, so Tarant- Tarantino was obviously able to to get him back, um, like walk him back into the into the scene and finish it off. But yeah, but yeah it almost it almost shut that whole scene the whole scene down from ever being filmed. And probably one of the most famous scenes of, of the entire film, not only of the entire film of of many 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 films. If you put if you say what's the yeah. favorite scene in any film or the most groundbreakingly shocking or something like that that well, would be up there yeah it's one of those it's one of those things where there's a particular meme being like you can't you can't hear pictures and then people will put a picture up of something that you'd be like oh I recognise that like if you put a a picture up of him like throwing like dousing the, the police officer you hear the music yeah you instantly you or again not. or if you hear the song on the radio or or yep. you're listening you're streaming music and you, you hear that song you think of that scene if you have seen this film like they are so synonymous with one another yeah, yeah it's so ingrained it's it, maybe it's an, a thing to do with the age of the song that because it's such an old song I don't even know when it came out but to hear it out of context well it would have been very the rare. 70s right okay Billy Super Sound of the 70s <laughs> keep on trucking Keep on yeah. trucking. Oh my God, we've been doing keep on trucking jokes for the last couple of episodes, seeing if anyone would pick up on it. Stephen Wright. Yeah, the voice. K, K- Billy Silver Sound of the 70s. I couldn't do it. I, could, I wouldn't even bother trying. I tried. We played around with the idea of like opening the, the episode, this episode, with being like, hello, welcome to the movie. And we just, we, can't, we couldn't do it. It just it wouldn't happen. You can't. He is the one and only. Yeah. He's the one and only. What a great yeah. soundtrack. Can't a do it. A great soundtrack. It's brilliant. Um, characters. Oh, that's, I'm all right with that. Like, Nice Guy Eddie's great. Uh, Joe is just this 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 monster of a human. And they, they put at his big desk, probably a big mahogany solid wood desk. He's got yeah. big <laughs> uh, horns. mammoth tusks. Like, that's what it looks like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Jeez. Like, a great, great little bit of set design. Yeah. I love how they go into the little the little bro fight, you know, and and I said he starts taking his jewelry off. Yeah, while they're talking, like, well, we're, we're getting into moments That's now, really cool. so it's probably a good time to jump into uh, into what about when? Is it really? I think so. Is it really? Yeah. Uh, let's get a taco. Okay. <laughs> we're going let's into it straight into it. So here we are, Reservoir Dogs, episode twenty six, seven, six. We've had it Five. on the screen before. I have no idea. And it it's in up. the title of the episode when you click Whatever it. Whatever it is, um, we're here. We're doing hashtag what about when. The best way to contribute to this section is through Twitter or Instagram. We are at the movie cal. You can send us an email as well if you like uh, to the movie cal at gmail.com. Um, it's and a good way to give feedback and just yes. or give us a, yeah, a list of awesome things about films that we're going to be talking about. Including like suggestions for films coming up in January. Yes, because we have no idea which ones we're going to do at this point. If you don't, that's all right. We'll work something out. Yeah, uh, yeah. And, we'll uh, be okay. But if you have anything you want us to talk about, let us know. And also we have a website, themoviecalendar.com, where you can see a list of all the movies we've done. And there are links on the site to every episode as well. Yeah. Uh, but subscribe on YouTube as well and follow us on Instagram, do all that kind of social media stuff yes please um, uh, so no hashtag what about when's from when's. social media for me this week how about you not from socials but I'll see by the time 
by the time I edit this and put it out, you might have some. I might put them on the screen. How embarrassing if we don't. I'll put nothing on the screen right here. That's fine. I'm okay with that. <laughs> um, did you want to start us off with a what about? Yeah, me? okay. What about when... What about when Mr. Blonde tortures the cop? Yeah, that's my that's my number one as well. It has to be. I've got... Yeah, I've, I've literally just got hashtag what about when ear hacked off <laughs> is what I've written down. Well, I've got no idea what you're talking about there. Yeah. Mine was much more descriptive. Oh, it's from a it's from a, a oh, Simpsons episode, an itchy and scratchy oh my God. episode. Have you seen that one? No. There's an itchy and scratchy cartoon where it's a itchy and scratchy special guest special guest director Quentin Tarantino. Oh, yeah, and uh, it's got the like the mouse like <laughs> throwing <laughs> petrol yes, on, and like God. one of its ears is cut off and on the floor as well. <laughs> it's the 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 details are great, and then it's got Tarantino himself coming to the scene, being like. So with this scene, I'm really just trying to show that violence is not cool, man. And and <laughs> what a yeah. great kids show. Yeah, I Simpsons. know. It's so funny. Wow, I can't believe so, we yeah, that's watched a, this as kids. That's a that's a what about when? Um, okay. Yeah, that whole thing is just so harrowing. And but there's also humor in there as well. Well, like weird humor. He's like talking into the ear, being like, "Do you hear that?" <laughs> Throwing it away. <laughs> funny. Yeah, <laughs> hilarious. <laughs> hilarious. I like how he intros the radio. He really plays, and he goes. You ever listen to K. Billy's Super Sounds of the 70s? Does he say it? He says yeah. something about it, right? Yeah. Great way to put music in. Get all your characters to love it and yeah. play it when they do weird awesome. things. Awesome and, scene. And one shot. A huge from, one take. From... After he cuts off the ear. After the ear cuts. Throws that, it down. Walking out to the car. Stay here. Coming back in and the sound dropping when he shuts the door of the... The warehouse behind yep. him. Go to the car. Beautiful mixing in the natural sound. Yep. Just actually Michael Madsen's car, by the way, because they didn't have a budget for a prop one. So that's actually his car. Also, a lot of the uh, the um, oh my god, the cast, <laughs> the actors. Uh, a lot of them were wearing their own clothes because they didn't have a wardrobe budget. So their like, own clothes. Yeah. So Sean Penn. Yeah. His like tracksuit. <laughs> that is his tracksuit. <laughs> Uh, Steve Buscemi is wearing his black jeans for yeah like they're actually his wow. his jeans for the entire so film. there was no like wardrobe they just went well ma- they would have just look we'll supply the ties and the jackets yeah the ties and the sunnies and stuff but wear like, your own a lot white of them shirt. just wear their own uh, they all wore their own stuff wow okay that's really cool which is fun I like that yeah um, you you uh, well okay what about but you're right there Oscar shaky shaky yeah. um, <laughs> sorry <laughs> I don't know how loud that was <laughs> it's pretty loud it threw me a bit what was that I didn't see him walking in um, when he walks out to his car uh, it, not that scene but when he says to them all hey I've got something to show you you'll like it oh, another yeah. but what about when what about when he opens the boot the shot from inside the the trunk of the car I guess we should call it the boot the trunk the boot the boot is the trunk here in Australia uh, the uh, reminiscent of what we were about to see with Tarantino's work, uh, Pulp Fiction. A lot of repetition in Opening up shots. scene. I like that watching this again, going, oh, look at that, look at that. It was that a cool was shot. Cool. Yeah. Uh, I've got a hashtag, what about when uh, we get introduced to these characters in the diner scene where they're just having a chat to each other yeah. about seemingly nothing, but yet we learn so much about them. Yeah, how good is it they're so nonchalant about what yeah. they're about to do? Yeah, that whole scene is just unreal. Um, the the guy who plays Mr. Blue, Eddie Bunker, mm. um, is a was a real criminal or ex criminal oh. in a, in a previous life before he became an actor. And is that he, why he was used? Here? Yeah, pretty much. And he he said that there is not a chance that a, a bunch of thieves who dressed that distinctively would be seen in daylight before <laughs> before doing a heist that would be that easily recognised. <laughs> no. Um, and I think that's I think hilarious that because like you, who cares they just look so cool what do they look like they were all wearing black yeah. suits white shirts skinny tie yeah oh, we're, oh there's one, one of those them guys yeah those people that's so, yeah, cool. that, but that whole scene is just magic and just sets you up for a film unlike any other like it yeah. lets you know that you're in for a ride that you've never been on before camera's always moving always low these characters are these are low people there are no morals here they've got values but they're not moral values except for Mr. White where he cares for this guy Um, but yeah I I love that opening scene as well it was really cool Uh, alright what about when Mr. Orange is writhing around in that car 
Oh, right early. Brutal. And it comes in over the top of the um, little green bag. Uh, after we get our intro shot of them walking, little green bag is still playing while the rest of the titles are being shown, yeah. the producers and, and everything. And you hear and him. You start to hear him screaming very yeah. faintly. And you're like, what is happening? Is that a puppy? And then flash, Boom. blood, white car, yeah. man writhing in pain. What other films are there where there's lots of blood on the interior of a vehicle? Pulp Fiction. Oh my goodness, <laughs> Marvin. Oh man, the name of the Marvin guy, right? the fa- We're not talking about that film yet. Marvin's Stop the it. cop. Stop it. Marvin's the name Stop of the it. cop. Uh, yeah, that seems incredible. We talked about that in the full, yeah, in the full episode. Um, him riding around in the car, just harrowing. Yeah, that was well um, hashtag. What about when Tim Roth? Uh, I should say Mr. Orange rather, um, or Freddie Noondike? I think is his actual name. Sure, I think Freddie. We hear Freddie. Freddie Noondike. Yeah. is his name uh, when he tells the commode story and it shows the story being told over like three or four time periods mm. as well as then you see him in the story telling the story yeah it's that kind of cinematic language that I think had never been seen before that made people just freak out it was great how they cut it into the story as well so we didn't have to hear the story multiple times yeah yes you hear the beginning of the story at the beginning of his learning it yeah and as it goes through he gets better and better until we're yeah. in the story and then it shows yeah. and then he's it, like they create uh, the visual of him being in the story as yeah. well i love it so much where he's just so i had to go to the bathroom and then whoosh, and then we're in the story like yeah. he, he 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 has lived this story Gosh. now he knows it so well and there's yeah. the, the cops in there telling their own story. And, oh my uh, God, they're telling a story. Yeah. And then he's the telling the story, story to the police. Panic hits me like a bucket of water. Oh, it's you excellent. Awesome American directing accent. and writing and acting and everything comes together. Editing. Sally yeah. Menke is an editor I have not mentioned. She is just a treasure. Uh, rest in peace, Sally. Um, you are sorely missed. Wow. Did she edit for Tarantino again? Uh, yeah, like her, his first like four or five, five films. Wow. Yeah. All okay. the way up to... Inglorious Bastards, uh, and then and then she passed away, and then uh, Django Unchained was direct uh, was edited by someone else. I wonder if if she had a big play in the time jumping of the edits. Well, it all would have been scripted, but yeah, she would have helped to to put it all together. Absolutely. Well, she would have put it together literally in terms of the idea of it and yeah. how to, how that plays with the 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 timeline and the pacing yeah I don't know um, that that would be really interesting because yeah. she may have because the story changed quite a lot right when they got a lot of budget in uh, well he he had a full feature script already okay but before the budget changed um, but yeah I guess she would have made it totally work you can't just cut these things together you need the perfect timings you need the perfect moments Do you have another uh, what about when I have one more what about when now this is full of what about whens but my last what about when is what about when they all shoot each other at the end yeah the standoff the standoff and Mexican standoff Joe shoots orange and white shoots Joe and nice Eddie shoots white and and who shoots Eddie I don't ah, know. oh you, is that a thing you, you figured it out it's the first I was time I've actually gone boom 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 wait a second I was, you were like there's something missing here yeah. I was actually going to pose a question at the end of this episode but I'll do it now I'd have to watch it um, so yeah comment below yeah who shoots nice guy Eddie He's the only character that doesn't have a gun pointed at him. Doesn't White? Doesn't no, he's White pointing it bang, at bang? He's pointing it at Joe. Yeah, but he shoots Joe and moves the gun across. He might. But I don't know if he made it to But Eddie. Nice Guy Eddie's bullet thing that comes off him yeah. is the first to go. He gets shot first. Is this if a you slow down the scene. In filmmaking? It's rumoured, yes. Yeah that his squib just went off early accidentally yeah. yeah um i like to think should i give my theory no I, wait for a podcast where you talk about up. movies i uh yeah to me i think mr pink shoots him from under the Ooh. under the ramp it's a great theory because he, he sees it he sees that it's all gonna happen like i'm out of here and he does it and then he grabs some diamonds and and runs that's probably not true um, I think it might be Mr. White going bang, bang, but and just the squib going off incorrectly. But yeah, I, I love the fact that like I used to have a t-shirt that said, who shot Nice Guy Eddie? No. Yeah, yeah, like years ago. I want that shirt. It's so good. I love it. 
I'm going to buy some printing paper from some office supply shop that yeah. irons on a shirt. And it's I'm like just that. niche enough that people will be like, what's that? But people who know will be like, that's a great shirt. Good question. It was Mr. Pink. Yeah. <laughs> yeah well, wow. or Mr. White. I have to watch that again. Damn it. Yeah, I know. I yeah, don't yeah, think poor, Mr. White gets off a second you. shot though. Because I remember seeing it. I did watch it again. Uh, that scene specifically. And I don't think he Such made it standoff. all the way yeah. up. The gun was down too uh, low. Well, speaking of, uh, of gun violence... Um, hashtag what about when Mr. White finds out that Mr. Orange is a cop oh. and when I say finds out I mean what about when Mr. Orange tells Mr. White that he's a cop oh and he just starts crying yeah he starts the, weeping oh, the, yeah the, the sheer look of you bastard emotion on his face that that betrayal that yeah. absolute betrayal because we find out in the film that he thinks he's jinxed because he did a heist years ago that they found out that there was an undercover cop and they were like they all just backed away and ran mm. um, luckily nothing bad came of it but yeah so when he finds this out it is literally the ultimate betrayal and he just breaks yep. down gun goes off to the to the side of the head and you know that it's coming that end shot of him just right close up yeah. crying in pain bang yeah gone that was so good I like how um Mr. Pink's character says, you know, where are you from? Does he know where you're from? He knows your name and where you're from? Great. You've got a rap sheet? Great. Yeah. They're going to find you. And then you see it play out later on. You see, I've got one of the guy's names. And he's like, cool, yeah. we'll find him. Like, oh, he's a Brewers fan. That must mean he's from Milwaukee. Yeah. Bing. Oh, it's so good. I thought, whoa, they're going to get him. Yeah. They're going to get the bad guys. No, everyone. Everyone dies. Yeah, but they get, they'll, they'll get Mr. Pink. They get him outside. Yeah, Mr. Pink gets to leave the warehouse at least. But no, that, that standoff he is... He gets the rotten prison. ...is unreal. Um, yeah, that's it for my, uh, for my hashtag what about lens. Well, you said to me before we started the episode that you were going to talk about something that you didn't. You were going to speak about the... Oh, there's probably so many things. This is a heavily, heavily, heavily male cast. Yes. There's one female character that gets spoken about, not Madonna... Um, <laughs> not a character a real person she's a real person but one character is oh I did say this didn't yeah, I yeah, yeah I know what you were going to talk about one character about. is a child who you yeah. know there's oh, how old I was you think say, she was yeah we were going to do oh, yeah, you were supposed to do the what about when which is why you didn't remind me which what about when I don't know what... when Tim when Mr. Orange gets shot in the car you were supposed to do the what about when and then I was going to lead into my story I totally well I did the what about when of him in the blood in the seat yeah but not getting shot doesn't matter. We can do it now. Yeah. So there's a... Uh, actually, it's... Here I'm going, I don't know what I'm meant to do now. I can't remember that. No, it's okay. Do you mean when they when they stop when, the car? Yeah, when they stop the car. And the lady and gets the gun out of her glove box. She shoots him and he shoots her He shoots her back and then yes. has the realization on his face of, I've just killed a civilian. Yeah, okay. Um, so that actor, the ac- actress, actor, the, woman, the, the woman in the car, yeah. uh, is actually uh, Tim Roth's dialect coach because he's not... American. Yeah, he's British, right? He's British. And so he had to have a dialect coach. And he was not a fan of the way that she uh, was teaching him. She, he, she, <laughs> she worked him too hard. And so he asked her antenna, it's like, can it be her that I shoot in the, <laughs> in the car? <laughs> Which I just thought was hilarious. Does she know that? Of course. Yeah. That's funny. Yeah, it's awesome. I loved it. I had to, I had to add that piece of trivia. Thank you for reminding me. Yeah, That's but I love really that. He was just funny. He was worked so hard. And he was just like, I hate this so much. He's like, Hey, can I? Can I shoot? <laughs> can, can I, I shoot her shoot in the you. film? Oh my god! Yeah, sure. We'll just get to take her shoes off first. <laughs> yeah, no. Put there's no. The there's no feet shots in this film. So well done, Tarantino, for showing some restraint on your first film. Yeah. Well, he wasn't sure if he was able to you know expose that side of himself yet he wasn't confident enough well he certainly has now yeah um, but yeah that's, that's what I've got thank you for reminding me that that's good reminding me of that that's great two carjacking scenes that one yeah. and then uh, Mr. Pink's getaway yeah when he gets run over he gets hit and he totally smashes that car windscreen that scene had to be done timed with the lights in the street because they didn't have a budget for a police presence to be able to turn off the th- to like shut the streets down, so wow. they had to time it. Be like, okay, and go, and then so he got into the car, and you see him look up at the lights before he goes because <laughs> he has to make sure they're green, otherwise he could get in, like seriously get into an accident in real life. 
So he's got to make sure that the light's green before he goes. Isn't it's that so interesting? Funny. Yeah. And then you see the shot through the back of the window when the cop is chasing him down through this intersection. To know that, that's pretty cool. Yeah, it's awesome. Because there that. were there were there's so many little details. There were like people that. watching. Yeah. You know where there always are when people do big city street filming. Of course, people are going to watch the action. But I, I noticed people looking at that. How many extras did they pay? None. The <laughs> they're, okay, they're pedestrians. Cool. Paid extras get told not what to look, what to not, what to, yeah, where to look. Not to look, yeah. Um, at that running scene down the street, I noticed a certain car game passed a few times. That It's good that you mentioned it was quite low budget, even though they got some more film with more money in the budget with cartel. Yeah, but $1.5 million is nothing. No, that's right. Like, that this is still a very independent film. That just means you get to have maybe some food on set. Exactly, uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, and a couple of extra lights in the studio. But uh, yeah, it was it was nice. And back to, I mentioned it in, an, in another episode where you can see movie magic and you can see what it takes to make a film. But when it goes past, you miss it. You only pick it up the third, fourth time you watch it. And you think, oh, oh, ooh, oh, very cool, very cool. I like that. Like this looking up at the lights thing. Yeah. Yeah, it's fun. Really cool. It's fun getting to know that some of the behind the scenes stuff. Yeah. It can enhance your experience. It can ruin the experience in a lot of uh, a lot of examples. But first time you watch it, just, I think it yeah. ruins. And, oh, yeah. Because the gonna, movie magic is no longer magic. Yeah, I'm not going to tell people that for the first time they watch it. Hi, no. if you're here and you haven't seen the film, congratulations. We I'm warned sorry. you. We did warn warned you. Warned you at the beginning. Go watch this. Um, but yeah, should we... Uh, what have I... I thought I had something else to say before we went on to the movie calendar. It's fine. There's, there's lots that we're going to leave on the floor for this one and I'm completely okay with that. We're going to be talking about Tarantino for the next few episodes anyway. So if there's anything that I've missed with regards to him, we can add it in. Yeah, I, I, I don't think there's anything else really. I mean, there are a few other things that... Yeah, but it's fine. We've we've done we've done really well. Yeah. We're going to add the film to the movie calendar, Reservoir Dogs. We had a date in mind for this film, we will say. We had right. to go with an alternate date because the date that we were originally going to put it on was already taken. So we would have broken the law. Alas, we don't want to uh, break cinema law no. and get arrested by the film police. No, um, but the, the original here. date that we wanted to put it on was the 21st of January which is the date that this film premiered at the Sundance Film Festival and changed the world of cinema forever. Um, we couldn't do that. We couldn't do that because Get Out is on that date. If you would like to find out why Get Out is on that date, click on the card above and you will be able to see that information. But the date that we have chosen for Reservoir Dogs is December 14th. Why, Lee? So at the other end of the year. Say that a lot, don't I? <laughs> and the reason why, like, you know, we talked about this. We came to the decision. It's written the... I, know. I know, I'm pretending. Um, and the reason why is because there is... I was doing some research for this episode, obviously, because uh, it's... Because it's what, what you do. It's fun to research, and I, I like doing it. Uh, and I found out that on December 14th, only a few years ago, 2017... Um, There was uh, a software update added to a video game called Payday 2, where you could perform a heist on that day in Los Angeles of a jewelry store with the Cabot crew, which is such a cool Easter egg. Obviously, it's Reservoir Dogs. Uh, And yeah, the fact that that came in on December 14th, I thought that was just a niche enough reference to put in there. And I love the idea of watching this film towards the tail end of the year. Where yeah. you can enjoy some really good pieces of cinema. That's about as niche as his shirt. Who shot Nice Guy Who shot Guy Nice Guy Eddie, yeah. I've got to get another That's shirt really like that. Cool. That's great. I wonder if anyone watching this has played that uh, played that update. Yeah, I'm sure I'm sure people have. People will discover this in the future and they'll they'll know if, that. If the characters wear black skinny black. I don't know, suits. but I do know that the the heist takes part in the video game over two days and you play the second day first and then you go back to the first day. <laughs> In true Tarantino style. Very cool. Yeah, so that's awesome. So that's the date we've chosen. Very cool. December 14th is where Reservoir Dogs will sit on the movie calendar. Uh, as for the next few episodes, we announced in the Goonies episode last week that it is going to be director December for Tarantino. So the next episode is going to be Pulp Fiction. Mm. So please make sure you get in your hashtag what about whens mm. or a date for the movie calendar for that one. Mm-hmm. If you haven't, um, haven't watched that one yet. So no, I mean, I've seen it. I haven't watched it this week. <laughs> you watched it last week could you imagine if I, I hadn't, hadn't seen Pulp Fiction oh we, this would be cancelled right we'd have to stop we'd have to shut down uh, and then after that we are going to be doing Kill Bill Volume 1 and then Kill Bill Volume 2 even though Tarantino calls them the one film 
we're going to do them as two separate episodes because they deserve an episode each. Yeah, cool. And then after that, January. We don't know. We'll announce no when idea we, when we work them out. Let us know if you have any ideas. Again, Twitter, Instagram, email. Best ways to do it. Thank you so much for joining us. I hope you learned something. I hope you had fun hanging out with us for a while. Thank you, Terence. Thank you, Lee. Did you enjoy that? I did. Keep on trucking. Just keep on trucking. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. And we will see you for Pulp Fiction. Awesome. Cool. Bye. See ya.